Greetings, everyone. It is Gleekon back again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we ran around the Barrens with, <clears throat> excuse me, Jalanji, the troll rogue, and uh, one of our three people, horde characters that are alternating as we run through the Barrens there. She's going to be wrapping it up probably in a few sessions because she'll be heading on to Ashenvale after she does uh, Wailing Caverns. We've also been reading, we just started reading the Alliance Player's Guide. We read the introduction in the first chapter the last time we did one of these alternate episodes of the Dungeons & Dragons setting. Um, and that just kind of set us up with a few races, Urbolg, Half-Elf, and Wildhammer Dwarf. So now we're going to do the second chapter, which is going to give us some variant class options for the Alliance. Just stay a while and listen as we read chapter two of the Alliance Player's Guide. Class options, and it says, be all that you can be in the Alliance. So we've got variant classes we're going to cover, racial iconic classes, uh, some specific creature classes that only can go with specific creature races, and then we'll wrap it up with some class-specific feats. And all of these should be Alliance-friendly. Um, <clears throat> so they said, basically... There's a, there's a lot of different customization al allowable for all of the different classes. Um, variant classes just alter some of them. The Arcanist class already has four variants. The Inscriber, the Mage, the Necromancer, and the Warlock. These are like more niche even than that. So, one variant of the Druid is called the Lone Druid. So they basically do not take animal companions, which is okay because, wow, druids don't do that anyway. Instead, they gain extra spells because they're tapped into the magic of the moon well, and they have uh, the prowess of stinging rain. rain. Um, <clears throat> basically, they're as good at fighting as a warrior is. <clears throat> so I don't know what you would call this. Maybe this is closer to a feral druid. I don't, um, someone that's going to be a good combat-focused druid. <clears throat> All right, another variant is a totemic druid, which is weird. Um, it doesn't make sense inside of the game, World, World of Warcraft, but because you can use totems, like it's more of an equipment thing in this, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons World of Warcraft, so I guess a druid totem would be kind of weird, but it's, I guess, something that could happen. Um, it just says that they follow totemic creatures. So basically, like, how there was a druid of the fang and a druid of the talon and stuff like that. It doesn't really say, like... Oh, I see. So then there are specific alterations depending on which one you would pick. Um, you, and it says if you want, you could be multiple variants. So maybe you want to be a solo druid of the fang or whatever. <clears throat> All right, so if you decide to be a druid of the claw, if we're bringing that back as a playable class, you gain, so basically you're a bear spec um, druid, you're going to gain roar, a greater roar. What do those exactly do? Uh, it, it, doesn't really say because we would need to look at the spell like abilities of, of druids. You gain an animal companion, which has to be a bear. You can wild shape, of course, into either black bear, brown bear, polar bear, dire bear, or huge dire bear as you level up. <clears throat> if you take on druid of the fang, I can't, I really thought that was the bear kind. I don't even remember. Um, you have spontaneous casting for lightning spells. Um, you can cast sleep, slumber. You have an animal companion, which is going to be snakes. Ah, I see. Yeah, that was... So if you went snake style. Um, I think we talked about that in one of the previous books, but I don't remember seeing any snake druids. Uh, maybe they're in Warcraft 3, and I'm just forgetting. Um, <clears throat> but they can also have uh, viper snakes, constrictor snakes, huge vipers, and they can wild shape into... Um, different size vipers and cobras and dire cobras and so on and so forth. Okay, and Druids of the Talon, it says they don't have as big of an impact as Druids of the Claw. I would completely disagree, depending on how you played. They were a big part of it. Um, I didn't like them as much, but Druids, Druids of the Claw were definitely OP. 
Uh, but if you wanted to spec out as Druid of the Fang, you gain Fairy Fire, Wild Speed, so you're faster, a Cyclone Spell, Wild Invisibility, Wild Maneuverability, Wild Companions, which I'm guessing have to be Bird. Um, it doesn't say that, but 3d6, yeah. So Wild Fury, they use their Wild Shape. They can, they also gain a like explosive Purple Fire Touch. These are all the different, they're actually giving you a full Druid of the Talon stat thing. So I guess that's a whole spec that wasn't available before and shows you where we're going to get these from. They do have carnivorous birds as their animal companions and their wild shapes are bird form. So I guess you're going to be bird form, but because you're lacking some of the power that comes from animals, they give you more magic to offset that. Okay. All right. So there's mage variant. There's the focus mage. Um, so I'm guessing that's kind of like the way that mages work. Wizards work in Dungeons and Dragons now, where you pick like a spec. Are you an evoker? Are you a conjurer? That kind of thing. Um, they get a boundless, a boundless mind. Um, it just says that they don't need their spell book to use their spells. Fine. Uh, they get an extra spell slot. They get a magic study. Like basically you get two feats, combat casting, Knowledge of Arcana, Spellcraft, use magic to basically kind of spec yourself out a little bit there. A meta magic study, I, I hate the meta magic feats. They're, I think they're a waste of time, but sure, you can gain a meta magic. Um, they can apply a meta magic feat he knows to a spell once per day. So basically, you get, gain more use of your feat. Signature spells, um, aka. So basically, you're getting to choose a cantrip and a level one spell. That, that you can spontaneously cast. Um, that's cool. So you're basically picking, like, if Magic Missile, you could be casting that all the time, which that's actually pretty dope. Dang. Sora. All right. And then there is a Paladin variant, the Oradin. And that's kind of funny. I've never heard that, but I guess you are focusing on their auras and they don't have a lot they don't gain spell slots and can't cast spells can't turn undead and they gain less hit points in return for that they have infinite auras okay and they can have multiple auras overlapping at the same time so if you these would not be fun to play but if you were like doing a war campaign kind of thing, just plopping some aura dins in the middle, that would be actually OP. OP, they'd buff up your army. Like, but of course, they're directly uh, proportionally worth, like, um, valuable compared to the amount of people they can buff around them. All right. So, like I said, we're also going to cover some racial iconic classes. And so some basically, I think each race is going to get an iconic, kind of like the video we watched at the start of World of Warcraft Classic. So if you were going to be a Furbolg, the iconic Furbolg would be Shaman. Okay, um, I would, I don't know that I think of Shaman automatically. I think Barbarian's a good one for them too, but okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I like it. It says, a Furbolg society places great importance on Shaman. Each Furbolg tribe contains at least one Shaman, and most of the time a Shaman leads the tribe. Lesser Furbolg Shaman range out with the hunters to protect their territory. Furbolgs share a connection with nature as well. Their Shaman communicate with the spirits of nature and focus on the divine magic that flows in Furbolg blood. The iconic Furbolg Shaman is a peaceful being carrying a feather-topped spear who guides his tribe with benevolence. When his anger is roused, however, he is a fearsome sight, using his magic to rouse himself and his warriors to a horrible frenzy. Um, <clears throat> so how does this, how do they change the regular shaman? They have the raging caster trait. They can rage like a barbarian, but when they're enraging, they're rage casting shaman spells. That's cool. They gain ghost bear, which is like ghost wolf, but their ghost wolf form is basically a black bear. And then they gain druid spells, um, as opposed to normal, uh, shaman spells. They actually have access to druid spells as well. That's cool. Or in, instead. Uh, I see. They can You can cast spells from the druid spell list as if they were shaman spells. So they can cast druid spells. They're just not quite as good as it. So like a, a level a one druid spell would take a level two spell slot. All right. For gnomes, it's the tinker. 
<clears throat> excuse me, the Tinker class. Gnomes are the Alliance's consummate tinkers. When a member of the Alliance thinks of a tinker, he thinks of a gnome, and when he thinks of a gnome, he thinks of a tinker. Gnomes are in a competition with goblins to produce the best and deadliest technology, a competition that is friendly or fierce, depending on the individuals involved. Gnomish technology is not quite as prone to malfunction as goblin technology, and gnomes tend to produce devices that have more specialized and unusual effects. Goblins make goblin rockets and shredders fairly straightforward, while gnomes create gnomish shrink rays and universal remotes. So those that's true. That's how it works when you pick your engineering spec. The iconic gnome tinker is a mad inventor, wearing goggles on her head as well as over her eyes, with a bandolier of equipment slung over each shoulder. She's covered with oil and scorch marks, looking forward to the next invention. Many find gnome tinkers amusing, but only a few do not respect or fear them. All right, so they don't gain pack rat, bomb bouncing, energy resistance. Instead, they gain a personal proficiency. Um, what does that do? So they basically... Uh, I see. Their, their devices malfunction less often than, say, goblins. They have an improved personal proficiency um, as they level up. So basically, they just have more and more reliable gear. And then they gain spark of genius, which makes them better at crafting. And it costs them less to craft. Dang, the dog. Sorry. Uh, He knows he's getting my attention on purpose. <laughs> he's just staring at me. And then he's like, intentionally, <clears throat> he runs in circles and tries to bite his own tail. And then he'll like, look, and I think he likes the clicking. We have wood floors, so he just likes to, to do it, to mess with me. All right, high elf mages. This is another iconic. So high elf, yeah, I picture a mage. The high elves are the most arcane imbued race in the Alliance, at least... They were when enough of them still existed to make a difference, because remember, most of them are blood elves now. Many credit them with discovering arcane magic, and it's a matter of... Although we did see some high elves in some of the quests we've done so far on playing through Classic. And it's a matter of historical record that high elves taught arcane magic to humans many thousands of years ago. High elf magi are unparalleled masters of their craft. They usually focus their efforts on shaping and changing their spells and expanding their repertoires, they do not let the distractions of familiars, of summoning elementals, or of excessive focus on fire and ice distract them from their chosen path. The iconic High Elf Mage is a dark and haughty individual claiming the knowledge of arcane secrets that never fell into human hands. So, at first level, they gain Arcane Legacy, which allows them to be considered smarter with more intellect um, when it comes to resisting... Um, when it when it comes to finding out if you get bonus spell slots or determining your DC, so that's pretty good actually. Um, they must spend, ah, uh, but they have to spend extra hours resting in order to basically uh, not like have a penalty because unlike humans, they're more susceptible to arcane corruption. Cross discipline study. Um, so basically they get to pick in addition to being mage, do they also want to study necromancy or warlock magic and they can cast some of those spells as though they were a mage, like th those are added to their spell list. Um, they also have meta magic expertise, which lets them, uh, more easily use meta magic feats. Yeah. Okay. The human mage is also an archetype. Um, when, while humans have not wielded arcane magic for as long as high elves, they have a strong tradition of it. When high elf magi brought the secrets of arcane magic to humans, the younger race showed a natural predilection for it. Human mastery of arcane energy was instrumental in vanquishing the ancient troll empire that threatened human and high elf civilization. Humans and high elves recognized the danger ar arcane magic posed and so created the guardians of Trisful, powerful arcane casters who guarded against demonic invasion. Since that time, Human ability with the Arcane has continued and evolved. Humans established the Kirin Tor, a council of Archmagi who ruled Dalaran, an Arcane city. Even when the destruction 
With the destruction wrought in the Third War, humans remain consummate magi, eager to use flame and ice to scour their enemies. Many human magi are creative, creating spectacular new spells or new ways to use existing spells. The iconic human mage, however, is a powerhouse of arcane energy. She summons creatures to her aid while pounding her foes with blasts of fire or rains of slashing ice. So she gains elemental puissance, allowing her to summon monsters. Like, basically, that, that's going to the water elemental thing, the way that a lot of frost mages summon water elementals. Um, and she's better, they're better at casting ice and fire. So it's, it's basically like Jaina problem we're here. Eighth level, they gain weave energy. Um, they can combine two or more spells, spell slots into a higher. So, okay. So like, let's say you only had two level one spell slots left. You could mix it into like a level two spell slot. That's cool. That's, that's cool. And actually that'd be super useful nowadays because a lot of the times you're like, oh, do I just cast, like, do I burn through all my level one spell slots with magic missile or could, would you be willing to give away all four to, or three of them to cast fireball again? Like absolutely. I'd rather cast the fireball. All right. So human paladin is another, uh, archetypal type of thing. They humans began the Knights of the silver hand and they remain the bulk of its membership. They're proud of the paladins contribution to the second and third wars, though they're ashamed at Arthas's betrayal. Makes sense. After such an enormous breach of trust, the paladins have resolved anew to eliminate all traces of corruption in their ranks. Many see humans as the quintessential paladins. The iconic paladin, human paladin, marches into combat, cloak flowing, hammer bludgeoning, faith unwavering. So at first level, so they don't gain some of their auras, retribution and might, but they gain extra weapon proficiency, specifically hammers. They gain aura of faith instead, which... Gives extra morale bonus to attack and damage. They gain an aura of searing light, which shoots illumination out from around them, and any undead within take extra damage. That's cool. All right, Iron the Iron Forge Dwarf Warrior. <clears throat> excuse me, has an interesting one, the Sharpshooter. It's interesting that we're calling that the Warrior class, but that's basically the Dwarven Rifleman. They have a strong tradition of firearms proficiency in particular they focus on the long rifle and the blunderbuss dwarven riflemen were valuable assets in the third war able to pick off vulnerable and important targets from behind their own lines honed senses allowed these skilled dwarves to detect when their equipment is likely to break down on them and they have a certain ability to quickly clear a jam so they can get back to fighting so they have firearm focus they're skilled with all firearms and they're better at avoiding misfire since that whole malfunctioning of technology is a big part of being able to use guns and bombs and stuff in in World of Warcraft Dungeons and Dragons because normally there's no tech available then. Um, they can also clear a jam fast. All right, before we read about the Night Elf Druid, we're going to read a little flavor text story. Rogno opened his eyes. He was a little surprised that he could. Oh. <sighs> Trying to... to do battle with the dog here and see like what will that will that help him be less loud but no it's not now he's just scrabbling around trying to play tug with me all right he was a little surprised that he could have been thrown into a tree by a giant irate furbolg okay so this is what this is picking up from the story we read in chapter one something dropped onto his shoulder he flinched and his reflexes kicked in his hand darted up and snatched the thing he held it in front of his face and considered it. Until a few seconds ago, it had been a squirrel. Now it was a gray-furred bloody pancake. It must have been between him and the tree when he smashed into it. It cushioned the impact. Well, that was lucky. Well, lucky for him. He glanced up. The furbolg was standing 20 feet away, growling an incantation, green light swirling around its claws. Damn. Rogno leaped to his feet, his head swimming. He heard a creaking noise behind him as the furbolg flung his claws forward and unleashed a beam of silver light. Rogno shouted and flung the squashed squirrel into the beam's path. He had time to see its mangled skeleton outlined in white light before the spell struck him, lifting him up a foot and throwing him back against the tree. Rogno landed on his feet. He blinked and smelled burning hair. You singed me bared, you great ugly turd! He shook his fist at the furbolg. He took two running steps forward, shouting as he did, 
I'll rip off your nose and shove it up. The creaking behind him was louder and was accompanied by a groaning and cracking. Ragno stopped and turned his head. The tree into which he had smashed was twisting. Mighty roots wrenched up from the ground. Branches shook and descended, forming thick arms. Two angry eyes stared out from a face in the dark. Oh, bugger, muttered Ragno. He braced himself. The ancient swiped with one huge arm, but Ragno took a step forward and leapt, his thick fingers and toes finding crevices in the ancient's bark. He scrambled up, hoping that growling in the background wasn't the furball casting another spell. Something whacked his back, hard. His face smashed into the trunk, slicing it open in numerous places. Ragno paused, coughed, then continued his ascent. He hurled himself onto the ancient's upper branches, disappeared into its leafy canopy, then parted the leaves and stared down. The ancient reeled, taking swipes at the dwarf and its branches. The furbolg flung another blast of light, and Ragno twisted behind a branch. The spell struck the ancient, and Ragno smelled smoking wood. The ancient swayed crazily. Ragno gripped the branch. Not the place for me after all, he muttered. He turned around the branch and stared down at the furbolg, eyes narrowed. His view jounced as the ancient jerked and swung its arms. He and the furbolg locked eyes. Ragno scarled. Little bit closer, you dumb tree. Little bit closer. Rawr! Ragno sprang from the branch, arms spread eagle, dropping like a titan's fury. And I think that's going to be... So that gives us that Firmal, Firbolg Shaman. I have no idea. I, at first I thought this was maybe a human, but now I think this is a dwarf. Probably a wild hammer dwarf fighting him. And then now we also have a tree, which I think we're, that might be a race, a uh, creature-specific class we'll talk about before we finish this episode. All right, there's also the Night Elf Iconic Druid. Um, they are just straight-up Iconic Druids. They're one of the few people that can even be dru Druids. Um, so some of the alterations are they don't get the brew potions type stuff. Instead, um, they can have the Voice of Cenarius, which basically gives them a better armor class because they're being warned by him. They hibernate, uh, which allows them to heal twice as fast, um, wouldn't be as effective now because long rest basically heals you to full. Um, and they gain ancient foes. So you pick something such as, oh, oh no, you don't pick it. They are better at casting spells against demons. Finally, there's the wild hammer dwarf barbarian. Uh, wild hammer dwarves are renowned for wild behavior and deadly skill at arms. They have a tendency to enter a fray armored with little more than a loincloth and body paint and still come out covered only with the blood of their foes. Or like coleslaw. Their fierce charging across the ground, or when soaring atop griffins, barbarians of other races seek to emulate Wild Hammer Dwarf's reckless ability to stay alive through sheer pluck while laying waste to their enemies. The iconic Wild Hammer Barbarian clutches his hammer and grins, showing gaps in his teeth. Feathers and beads are stuck in his sweaty hair and beard. Come get some, he shouts before letting out a howl and charging forward. Um... So they have different weapon proficiencies than normal barbarians, and they don't have trap sensing. Instead, they oh they don't use ranged weapons at all, which is weird because you would think wild hammers would normally still throw. Instead, they gain fearless, um, meaning they're literally immune to fear. Lucky defense, which gives them extra luck bonuses to armor class, so their armor just continues to improve as they level up. And like a rock, they gain extra hit points and a raging mount. Um, when they rage, they're even better at like using their mounts. Okay, that's cool. But the trade-off is that they, they're wild hammer dwarves that can't throw hammers. So that's weird. All right, so there's some creature classes. Um, it says, most many monsters are suitable for player characters such as Nerubians, Dryads, Keepers of the Grove, etc., um, so you can take racial levels in those classes as opposed to just class levels. And this is what you're going to get from some of those. Um, the rate, the creature class basics, you obviously have to be that creature to take a level in that creature class. Um, if you're a creature that has a creature class, you have to take levels in that class. So you have to max out that class before starting like your your career is something else. Interesting. But you don't get multi-class penalties for doing so for that particular setup. Um, 
They don't gain hit dice and skill points only at certain levels. And maybe it makes up for that by they start with more. Um, they don't gain feats unless it otherwise sets up. So basically these are all like lame classes and everything else is just stats. So ancient protector. Ancient creatures, ancients are creatures that resemble living trees. They're important in night elf culture and vital to night elf society. They serve their night elf allies as mentors, sages, teachers, guides, and protectors. While these creatures are not numerous, the most plentiful of them are the ancient protectors. Ancient protectors are the warriors, soldiers, and guardians of the ancients. While other ancients spend much of their time training night elves in the ways of the bow and glaive and spell or advising night elf leaders, ancient protectors focus their efforts on protecting nature and their allies. Several often station themselves in the borders of night elf military camps, gathering a supply of large rocks for ammunition and rooting themselves to the ground. There they scan tree lanes and the skies for enemies. Others patrol the forest, moving among the lesser trees, ensuring that hostile intruders do not penetrate to the night elf heartland. Most ancient protectors are old, though night elves and ancients still possess the druidic magic required to create seedlings. Some young ancient protectors feel that the best way to fulfill their protective duties is to strike out into the larger world bringing the fight to the Night Elves' enemies. Some seek to rediscover Calderai artifacts or to punish the Naga for their wickedness and treachery. Usually, even adventurous ancient protectors remain near Night Elf lands. But a rare few leave their lands behind to travel Azeroth. The individuals are exceptional and unique. Most ancient protectors remain in northern Kalimdor with their brethren. Yeah, I just can't even imagine playing through a campaign as one of these guys. Uh, but one of my favorite Dungeons and Dragons campaigns uh, settings that I ever did was, I can't remember what it was called, but it was basically all how to run a campaign as a dragon. And it was really cool. I really liked it a lot. Our other ancients and night elves are adve sea adventuring ancient protectors as extreme oddities. Something that the druidic magic that empowers these creatures has gone awry in these individuals, whether for good or ill. A few see adventuring ancient protectors as perversions and as beings that betray their birthright. Some see them as brave and hardy spirits of nature, willing to travel the world to protect their charges. Most look at them with distant bemusement. All right, so of course they are strong. Um, they have low light vision. They are a plant. They're immortal. And they their weapons are natural weapons. They also have natural armor. They can eat trees to heal. They can take root, which gives them, uh, they can't be moved, basically. Um, they are really good at hiding in the forest because they can. They basically just are a tree. Um, to any gear that they have to use is, is more expensive. This is their stat table. Oh, you can go all the way up to level 17 as an ancient protector. So basically, yeah, don't take another class. Just be them. Um... They do continue to grow in size as you level them up. They become from large to huge. They have a rock throwing power, a tree slam power, and a trample. Okay. Dryads also have racial classes. Allies of the Night Elves, the Dryads are the daughters of the demigod Cenarius. They resemble gray fawns with the upper torsos of Night Elf women. They are peaceful by nature and despise violence. However, like ancients, Night Elves and their brothers are their are the keepers of the grove, dryads fight to protect the forest and their allies. They're particularly adept at destroying magic and are immune to its effects. Most dryads remain in the forest, frolicking with the animals, dancing in the rain, and occasionally bringing nature's wrath onto their enemies. Some dryads, however, leave their forests and become adventurers. Some encounters with hostile forces spark this desire. They wish to bring the fight to the enemies of nature. Others are curious about the world outside their forests and wish to experience new environments and meet new beings. Other dryads and night elves see adventuring dryads as a bit less unusual than adventuring ancients. Dryads possess an innate streak of curiosity, after all. However, adventuring dryads are still branded as eccentrics who go against the natural tendencies of their kind. After the so ninth level, so basically about half the time, you can take dryad levels. But then once you max that out, like sure, you could become, I don't know, a druid or something. They are, have extra spirit, which is basically wisdom. Um, they're quadrupeds, so they're treated like that for carrying things and letting people ride on them. They are considered a fey. They're immortal. They gain a little bit extra natural armor. It's hard to make armor for them. Um, if you play, a, you must take levels in the dryad creature. Okay, and then they can become a druid. So basically, if they become a second class, it's most likely going to be a druid. 
and they can dispel magic basically at will. They can also poison. They have a special poison. They are immune to magic once they get high enough level. So cool, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. You're trading a lot of gear and stuff like that for some magic immunity. All right, and the other uh, nature-based one is Keeper of the Grove. The mighty sons of Cenarius, Keepers of the Grove, are potent repositories of druidic lore. They dwell in the forest and keep them safe. They are ancient allies of the night elves, often giving them gentle guidance in spiritual and druidic arts. They are implacable foes of all who defile the forests. Keepers of the Grove have the bodies of mighty stags and the upper torsos of night elf men. Great antlers sprout from their heads. A keeper's right arm is twisted and changed from the elbow down resembling a branch-like claw of the sort ancients possess. Keepers of the Grove usually remain far from civilization, dwelling in secluded woodlands and sacred groves. They move to support night elf settlements when they're needed, then melt back into the trees once more. A few Keepers of the Grove, however, perform, prefer a more active role. They travel the world in search of additional lore and knowledge of their enemies. Some seek to test and develop their skills against their enemies, both ancient and new. The Burning Legion, the Scourge, the Naga, and the forces of Illidan Storm Rage. They may guide other young druids on such journeys. Adventuring Keepers of the Grove are viewed with skepticism but respect, such as the reputation of Keepers of the Grove that most other night elves, dryads, and other creatures assume that they know what they're doing when they choose to travel a path of adventure. Elder Keepers of the Grove consider young Keepers who undertake such journeys to be unnecessarily endangering themselves. The night elves need all the protection they can get here in northern Kalimdor. Whatever the case, Adventuring Keepers of the Grove make frequent stops back in the forests of their homeland to share the, the knowledge gained on their travels. Um, they also gain... Uh, spirit, they are large quadrupeds. They're faster than dryads. They're basically like horse size. They have the low light vision. Uh, they're fey, so they have the fey immunities. They have immortality. They have a natural weapon in the form of that claw. Natural armor on par with the dryad. Um, they gain some bonus languages as well. And you have to take keeper class, keeper of the grove class, and then you could probably become a druid as well. Um, they gain druid spells, though, throughout being, like, they can cast some druid spells even when they're in that form. So it's a good one to pick. They can rebuke and command plants and animals. That's cool. They have spontaneous casting when it comes to summoning animals. They have spell resistance, so not quite as potent as the dryads. Um, and they have a strider, so they're good at traveling through the nature-type terrain. Um, and they don't leave a trail when they do travel. They can speak with animals, speak with plants. They can commune with nature like the spell. And they have a group stride, so they help those around them travel through once they get high enough level. Yeah, how far? How many levels of this? Oh, yeah, they go up to 15. So there, you're pretty much going to keep them. You might tack a couple of druid levels on if, at the highest level. Flush out your magic. Okay, there's also the mountain giant. So we have another big natural creature, and it's a... Um, similar to like the Keepers of the Grove. Or not Keepers of the Grove, the Ancients. Like the other creatures presented here, Mountain Giants are ancient allies of the Night Elves. In ages past, they assisted with the Titans with the creation of the world. They crafted the peaks, the cliffs, and the caves of Azeroth's mountains. They've always been implacable foes of those who would spoil nature, thereby harming the Titans' great work. Recently, the Mountain Giants reawakened to discover their world beset by blood and fire. Pulling trees from the ground to use as clubs, they join the Night Elves against the Scourge and the Burning Legion. Mountain giants appear to be made mostly of stone with tough bits of plant, wood, and thick vines and the like interspersed here and there. Many bare patches of moss that grew during their long time of dormancy. They're massive and slow moving, but pack a wallop. Several wallops, in fact. Mountain giants are few in number. Most remain in the mountains around northern Kalimdor, assisting their night elf allies or engaging in inscrutable behavior that probably helps nature somehow. Only rumors speak of young mountain giants. Some people believe that all the mountain giants that exist were created by the Titans and the new ones are not going to show up. Every once in a while, a mountain giant leaves its home in Kalimdor and travels into the larger world. That would be weird. An adventuring giant usually joins a particular night elf friend, but not always. Mountain giants rarely explain their actions. They simply walk out of the forest and travel the roads or the trackless wilderness or board a ship without a word. Perhaps they simply assume that everyone else takes it on faith that they know what they're doing. That is weird. Um, on mountain giants, let's see. Young mountain giants don't exist. So you could, if you basically, if we're creating one, you could be a newly awakened mountain giant and you're just getting more powerful starting. It. If you're a level one mountain giant, I see. So they're saying creating them at level one is weird. 
if you did want to make a level one mountain giant, then you'd ha they're saying like maybe you could say it's a magical experiment. Um, they they are big and tough, but slow and not smart. When they are medium, when they start, they don't get the penalties and bonuses for their size. They're tiny little giants, um, but eventually they would they do continue to grow. They are immortal. They are made of earth. They do have natural weapons in the forms of their fist. You would take every level. You would take. They don't get classes. You would have to go up to level nineteen as a mountain giant. Um, but sure, if you hit level twenty, you could start taking warrior classes to become so good at fighting. Um, they have spell resistance. They just have. They're not proficient with anything except their own weapons. They do continue to grow. Um, they throw big rocks and they can catch rocks that are thrown at them. And then here's the vital statistics of these, the height, base, uh, how you can generate height and weight. And okay. So to wrap up this chapter, we're gonna just take a brief overview of what are the Alliance specific feats. There's a table listing them. So we're gonna skip over that because we're going to just look right at them. All right, so there's Awesome Blow, which is an Alliance Warrior feat, which you punch people so hard they fly away. That's pretty cool. There's Bond with the Land. Um, you Anyone can take this, and basically, you if you're out in nature, uh, specifically the home ground that you're responsible for, you do more damage. Chaos Energy Master is a tech, so that'd be like a tinker kind of thing. Um, if you basically you are better and you get less malfunctions when you have devices that specifically use chaos energy, um, community leader, it says you have to be a leader of the community from one, one type of job. So are you good at diplomacy, hunting, whatever? So you've got to have the prerequisite feat. So if you want to be a community leader in the hunting community, you better have the rich hunter feet, for instance. And it just basically lets you inspire those around you. Craggy exterior. Anyone can take this. Uh, you have a rough hide, um, which gives you tons of mega extra armor. And if, they, if someone gets a bad roll against you, they have a chance of stunning themselves. That's cool. Dance spell, um, you, oh, so you have to have a natural armor bonus of plus 10 to pick Craggy. So basically this is a mountain giant thing. Maybe ancient protectors if they get high enough. Um, this, you have to be good at performing and dodging to gain this. And then you cast a spell that uh, basically lets you mesmerize. Um, Oh, no, it allows you to use dancing as your, like, verbal somatic material components to cast a spell. Oh, okay, cool. Doctor, you're just better at healing spells. Cool. Um, no, prereq means you, you just have to basically be at least third. You have to be able to cast second level healing magic or magic period. Empower spell-like abilities that you have greater power, which lets you... Um, have the effect be like 150% of whatever it was, but you already, you have to be at least six level to take it. Emulate another, you can disguise yourself to look like another race. The prerequisite, you have to be a half breed. So let's say you were a half orc and you did emulate orc, you're particularly good about, people basically just treat you like you're an orc instead of a half orc. Spend spell like ability, you have to be at least fourth level and it lets you um, the ability lasts twice as long as normal. And you can take it, oh, but you have to pick, oh, but it's spell like ability, not spell. Same thing with empower, spell like ability. So these are natural racial traits, basically, that you, or, or class traits that you're empowering. It's not actual spells. So you're saying, like, I am extending my whatever. Uh, I, let's say there was a natural invisibility that you could have. It would last twice as long. Extreme abilities, you have to have a racial bonus to an ability and a racial penalty to an ability. So for instance, let's say you're the 
the mountain giant that we just looked at. Um, you choose which one you're, you get extreme. So you'd be extremely strong, but extremely dumb, for instance. Fame death, um, that just lets you do it. So people, when you play dead, people believe you. Focused repair, you have to be able to use tech devices pretty high and craft. So this is for tinker experts. Um, helps you repair better. Gnomish engineering specialist. So if you pick gnomish engineering as your as your spec, basically, you already have to be very good at engineering. And it now allows you to gain a bonus to crafting stuff. You craft faster, you craft cheaper. Same thing for goblin, exactly. So it's just you're picking a spec on that. Greater dance spell, uh, same as before, you have to have dance spell, but now when you use this greater dance, it's, your spells are more powerful. Improved dark vision, you see further with it, you have to have dark vision. Improved lightning reload, you have to already have the lightning reload and, and be pretty in you know, a high enough level. And uh, whatever, so basically if, if a firearm takes a standard action to reload, yeah, so before it would, this is just letting you lo load you faster, basically. Improved Shadow Meld, as opposed to the weak Shadow Meld we saw before, you, you're allowed to move when you're in Shadow Meld form. That's cool. Improved Stability, so you have to already have stability, so you're extremely resistant to being moved back. Improved Stone Cunning, again, you already have to have that, and you're even better at it. Improved Stone Flesh, you get to use your stone flesh ability more often, probably for a dwarf. Iron Forge Axe Rip. You are, are you have to be specialized in axe, and that lets you um, you can rip your axe out doing damage. Like basically, you, you do damage from hitting, and then you do damage as you pull it out, which is kind of cool. Limited arcane ability. This is a, a half elf only and you get to basically have some of the racial cantrip type power that elves would get as racial abilities lion assault is a as a warrior move um you have to have power attack it's like an extra power attack and oh you hurt yourself and then by hurting yourself you then give yourself a damage buff it's kind of that's kind of like uh like a blood rage kind of style move. Low light vision development. Uh, if you already had low light vision, it now becomes dark vision. Mechanical affinity. You are be better about um, disabling tech traps. Mount ba bond. Uh, so if you're already good with, the, with that, you can now get even more bonuses to the mount that you've bonded with. Quicken spell-like ability, just like Quicken spell, you cast it faster, but it works on your spell-like ability. This is the trait for those, like a quick table, for empowered, um, quickened, and extended spell-like abilities. Racial pride, you, if you're teamed up with people in your race, at least two of them, you're you guys, you are stronger on the attack. Racial unity, same thing, but you're. What's the difference? Night Elf Power. Oh, okay. Racial Unity is the opposite. If you are teamed up with people that are not your race, you're stronger. Okay. You get both of them. You always get the plus two. You can have both. Oh, but it has to be adjacent. Yeah, I guess if you really spec very specific like formations. Racial Weapon Focus is... Yeah, but how if you're adjacent to four people, how could you hit people? Um, you're especially good at your traditional racial weapons and same thing, racial weapon specialization. These are both warrior things. So again, you're very good at the ones that come with your race. Racially skilled, you get extra racial bonus to whatever your racial skills are. Shot in the dark is a blind fighting, but for guns. Wakeful nature, um, you only need to sleep half as long to gain the hit points back. And Wild Dance spell is the final one. When you cast, when you're using the dance spell, you're gaining damage reduction. And um, the longer you dance, the greater your damage reduction increases. So that's cool. So as you're dancing and casting, 
you're getting more and more resistance to damage. So that's neat, I guess. Um, I guess the one kind of qualm that I could make against this is it's all devoted to the nature classes. Like there's no generic overland, like overarching alliance thing. This is basically specifically the niche of do you want to play some of these night elf neutral helper type races? Here's how you could do it. Here are the feats, here are the classes, um, which is not what our what our races were all about. So, yeah. All right, cool. So we have another episode in the pipe. Five by five. Thanks everybody so much for watching and listening, and I will see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.